Okay. Today we're going to go uh, venture forward. Uh, last th this weekend was about uh, eating our sea legs here for um, putting dots in a piece of paper, doing Lewis dot diagrams, figuring out the hybridization by regions of space, incorporating our double, triple, and bond pi bonding for the double and triple and the sigma overlapping. Uh, talking about polarity of the molecule, thinking now that we have the structure, think about it, dots to a piece of paper, figuring out the hybridization is valence bond electron theory, we can now figure out the geometry of the molecule. The geometry of the molecule, like especially in biology, gives us so many types of properties. For us, it's about the, it's about the polarity. As I said before, make sure you understand that from dealing with an ion, positive or negative, okay, it is not going to be polar or nonpolar. It's non-applicable. Like asking number five, it's marital status. It doesn't make any sense. If I'm a positive or negative ion, I don't have a different side to me. Okay? And just be aware of those ionic compounds. All right. So in any case, today we're going to venture forward because now last this weekend's homework, I should say, I'm saying last night, but for most of you it was, because you guys do Sunday night homework when I give it to the weekend, just how it goes. You ran into a resonance structure. And I, and, and I want to be able to get to that point today. Also, last week, we dealt with a compound that you may have written an alternative Lewis dot structure for. So I kind of want to jump right in and get into this um, skill. And we're building on skills. Right now, we should know how to do it. Lewis dot diagrams, single, double, and triple. We should identify hybridization from SP, SP2, SP3. We should be able to, once we have that structure, be able to predict its geometry, the bond angles, and then uh, electron domain geometry, and then the uh, molecular geometry where the atoms are, and then the polarity. All of that is from dots in a piece of paper. And we're going to find that <laughs> dots in a piece of paper give us all of, a bunch of information, but we're also going to find that it limits us to a certain point. This valence bond theory that we're dealing with, um, you know, dots in a piece of paper, hybridization, has its limits. It's powerful. But it does have its limits because, well, guess what? Electrons, we learn, have a lot of wave properties, and we treat them as dots. But we get pretty far with this. So this is the next little piece to, to build on this. Okay, and where do we use this idea of what we call formal charges? Is when we have a more advanced structure that I'm asking you to draw, you may have multiple ways to actually draw the Lewis dot diagram. So formal charges is a, is a bookkeeping method that helps uh, the Lewis dot structure builder, the chem student or the chemist, to make sure that they can draw the best possible or the more realistic or most probable structure. Okay, so let me just kind of dive in, and I have this example written here, but kind of think with me how I get to this point. So I have the thiocyanide, uh, thiocyanide ion here. It's an ion, it's got brackets and charges, and we have NCS. So let's just draw this. You can just watch me do this. Okay, not what, that's an invisible ink, I guess. All right. So, NCS here. NCS. And then NCS again. Okay, and I certainly could make this a little better. Okay, now, so we're going to throw out all the dots or the valence electrons out to do this and try to understand where we're coming from. I'm asking you to draw a Lewis dot diagram for the thiocyanide, and I can actually draw three different ones. Now, you may have just drawn one, but there are two other probable ones. We did this for a homework last, uh, last week, but I'm going to show you the three possible ones. Okay, so let's start with nitrogen. Nitrogen has five valence electrons, and I'm going to start with what I know nitrogen loves to do, and that's the triple bond. Okay. In fact, um, I will. I'll do that over here. Okay. So nitrogen gives one, two, three, and two lone pairs. Okay. Carbon. I'll make it uh, blue. It has four valence, but the triple bond it's going to need one, two, three, and then throw one in the middle here. It's four. Sulfur. It's going to have one, two, three, four, five, and six. 
Now, every element in my drawing, and that's what it is, it's a, it's a drawing, it's a hypothesis of what this possibly looks like. I just threw out the valence electrons, and you notice that the nitrogen by sharing electrons has eight, the carbon by sharing has eight, and the sulfur by sharing has seven. So we're going to draw, I'm going to draw, a triangle to show that that electron has been added somehow. Somehow that electron has been taken from a metal or somewhere in the environment. And now the whole thing, of course, is negative 1. And that's why you draw brackets around. And that's a skill you should have already. If something is negative 1 in your structure, you're trying to draw a Lewis dot diagram, you're adding an electron. And I put it there. Okay. Now, don't fall in love with the idea that the electrons belong to just their own. The idea is we th throw dots out, and some people will teach, hey, throw out all the valence electrons to the side and just put them around the atoms so that you get a, a stability number. Now, the number that's stability for us for second row elements is the octet rule you here. The 8, you fill the S, two electrons, and the P, you get a total of 8, and everyone has 8 here. Okay, so let's now draw it now by putting a double bond with the sulfur, which is actually sulfur loves to do. It's under oxygen, so it loves to share two more electrons. So let's do that. So let's put a double bond here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Carbon has four valence electrons. One, two, three, four. And, uh, and again, I was supposed to put blue for carbon. Purple. Thank you for, is it purple? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Those darn X chromosomes. Okay. Uh, one, two, three, four. Looks blue to me. All right. One, two, three, four, and five. Now, if you notice, sulfur has its eight. Good. Octet is satisfied. Carbon has its eight. Octet is satisfied. But you notice nitrogen what? Seven. Seven. So its octet is not satisfied. So that one, we're going to throw in the extra electron. Remember, we know it's negative one. So we'll put the, the extra one there. And of course, they're all going to be negative one. But we draw brackets around to say, hey, I know that this is a, this cluster is negative one. It's not polar. The whole thing is negative one. Okay, moving on. Let's now make a triple bond with the sulfur. Okay. Still. I'm not breaking any rules here. Both of these structures are possible. Why are they possible? Because both of them are fulfilling the octet rule. So put the valence electrons on. Now I'm going to chill bond for sulfur. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Carbon has its four valence. One, ah, thank you for reminding me, telepathically. Okay. Well, one, two, three, four. Okay. And then this nitrogen. Uh, one, two, three, four, and five. Okay. So we've got some issues here, though. This carbon is sharing its eight. Okay. So it has eight by sharing. Sulfur has how many? Nine. Nine. Nitrogen has what? It's a total of six. So let's just say nitrogen's going to gain that what? That extra one. Okay, to give it a negative one. But to make this work, this has nine, this has seven. This electron has to move over. Correct? Yeah. Everyone see yeah. that? Yeah. And you may say, Mr. Grotsky, well, I, you know, I don't like that. Too bad. Okay, th throw out the valence electrons, put the bonds together so that everyone is fulfilling its, its, its stability number. Remember, hydrogen is going to be two. Here, most of the time, it's eight. And we're going to learn to, by tomorrow, there's elements beyond atomic number three that can have more than eight. But right now, we're going to set, stay with the, the eight here. Now, this gained an electron, and now it's negative one. OK, so I have drawn all the possible structures that you could write that follow everything I've taught you. The octet rule has been satisfied for all of these. The question is, are these all probable structures? Is, is there one better than another? And there is. And the way to identify that is with formal charges. Now, formal charges is really a bookkeeping method for the Lewis diagrammer. I don't think you should use that word, but I like that. To uh, suggest what's their best possible structure. Now, what formal charges is, it tells you who gained and who, lose, who lost electrons to make this work. 
clearly we just saw what here? We saw that I took an electron from sulfur and put this over here to make this work. Formal charges is going to tell us that that's not something that is most probable. And you'll say, well, why? Well, these are all what? Nonmetals. Nonmetals have a high Z number, a great attraction for electrons, right? They're electronegative. So if they're attracting their electrons pretty strongly, the idea that there's going to be a transfer of electrons is probably not very likely. So you could probably see the one where there was probably the most unlikely or the most unlikely diagram would be where? The diagram to the left, because you saw me move an electron. But formal charges kind of is a way for us to kind of see that, okay, by using um, numbers. And what we do here, and it's very simple, you take your valence electrons. These are the electrons that are given to the element, right? And we're going to subtract the assigned electrons from your drawing. The assigned electrons are what we give the atom or the element, okay, to make this work. All right? And you'll get positive or negative numbers. These are not oxidation states. They're just a, a bookkeeping method to say, hey, if I'm positive one, that means I lost an electron to give to another element in the diagram. If I'm negative one, I gained an electron from another element from the diagram to make it work. And what we want is we want the lowest possible, we want the, we want the greatest number of zeros. We love a diagram where, at least it makes sense to us, that the most probable um, molecule would be where the atoms come with their valence electrons and they use exactly those electrons to make it work. When you start transferring electrons like we just saw here, that becomes pretty iffy for us. And that's what we do here. So essentially, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to find the formal charge. And that will tell me a story about, in my diagram, did I gain or lose one? So again, formal charges are the valence electrons you have minus the assigned. Now the assigned in the drawing, the drawings here, are based upon half of the bonding and all of your lone pairs. The best way to learn it is to watch me do this up here. So what are the assigned electrons that I gave this end here? Well, I consider the fact that now it owns all of these lone pair. I know that they originally come from different places, but right now in my drawing, it owns all of these lone pairs, and it owns half of the bonding. And I know something, that nitrogen has five valence electrons minus those assigned, which are all of the lone pairs and half its bonding, so five minus seven. And that gives me a negative two, and I put that there. A negative two is a bad number. A high negative number or a high positive number tells me that electrons are transferred. That's a red flag. Okay, carbon has four valence electrons. Okay, and you take all the electrons that I assigned it in this drawing. Well, half of it's bonding. It has no lone pairs. So it started with four valence electrons, and it's using four. So that's a great number for formal charges, zero, to using exactly what would what it brought to the table? That to me is a high probability of what carbon's going to do. Sulfur, half its bonding, and then all of its lone pairs. That's what is, is assigned to it in my drawing to make this work. And that's six minus five, which of course is negative one. And if you notice something about my formal charges, they add up to the total charge of the molecule. The molecule isn't an ion; it'll be zero. In this case, because it's negative one. Notice a negative 2 plus a negative 1, I'm sorry, uh, a uh, positive 1. 6 minus 5 is positive 1, sorry. Okay, it gives me a negative 1. Now, what does these formal charges tell us? They tell us that sulfur is positive 1. It means it lost 1. Did you see me move this one over here? Mm -hmm. So it lost an electron. It has one less electron than what it brought to its table. Okay? Nitrogen is negative two. It gained two. It has two more than what it brought to the table. All right. So these are bad numbers here. We love zeros. Let's continue on. Okay. Again, if you want to use the formula, you can. If you want to just see what the assigned are, what are the assigned? For this end that I drew, all the lone pair plus half of its bonding. That's what's assigned to this end, or at least I assigned to make this work. So that's going to be five valence electrons minus six. That's a negative one. Okay, what does that mean? In my drawing, nitrogen needed what? One more electron to make that work. Okay, carbon. Half its bonding, all of its lone pairs. It doesn't have any lone pairs, so half its bonding is four. We know that carbon has four valence, four minus four. That's a zero. 
It's a great number. We love that number. It's using exactly what it brought to the table here. Sulfur, six valence electrons, it's under oxygen. All of its lone pairs, half of its bonding. So it's assigned in my diagram six. Well, six minus six, zero. Can everyone see that this is a more preferred structure than this one? Because I have what? Two elements that are zero. That's more realistic. Here you have two elements passing electrons, especially this one. It's grabbing one from the sulfur that's at the end. What are the chances that that can happen, especially the fact that these guys have high electronegativities? So this is telling me right away that if I had two choices, this is a preferred structure. This would be the right structure. Let's continue on. Nitrogen is one, two, three, four, five. Hey, nitrogen loves triple bonds. Five minus five, five valence minus the assigned is zero. That's a good one right there. Carbon has four valence electrons. Four, mi four minus is four that's assigned, half its bonding. And of course, all lone pairs, it doesn't have any lone pairs. So that's a zero, I'm loving life here so good. And then sulfur, half its bonding and all of its lone pairs, it's assigned seven. It has six valence electrons, six minus seven, negative one. Again, the middle one has negative one plus zero plus zero is negative one. The one to the right is zero, zero plus negative one. Both of these, all of them, add up to negative one. Clearly, which is the one that we can get rid of? We can reject the one to the left first. And again, why is that? The formal charges are too high. You have too many that are not zero. You have one that's plus two. Okay, that means two electrons had to be moved to that atom, all right? So anytime your formal charges are farther from zero, either two positive or two negative, that's too many electrons that had to be manipulated to make this work. So now I'm left with these two. These have two zeros and one negative one. Well, something has to have a negative one, right? Didn't this structure gain an electron to make this work? So that yeah. you, it, it's inevitable that one of those three have to have a negative one. Which one do you think is the best structure? Yes. Correct. Well, so can sulfur. Yeah, it's not the best way to do business, though. True. But, I think what you learned, if what we're really deciding, since these both have two zeros and one negative, we're trying to decide which one is preferred based on the negative. Aren't we saying which one has a greater ability to gain an electron? Mm -hmm. Hello, periodicity. Which one, the N or the S, is more probable in picking up that electron from the environment? The N. The N is more electronegative, which means what? The N is in the second principle under level. Has a high Z number, right? What are the three most electronegative atoms? I'm saying electronegativity, but really know it's what? It's phon, right? F, O, and N. Sulfur is not going to attract electrons as much. Why? Being in N equals 3, it's, in a, it's, it's electrons are what? Physically far apart. You say, well, it's got a higher Z, but what we know, as you go down a group, the Z offsets the shielding going down to another energy level. So it's the N number. So nitrogen is more electronegative. And therefore, that's a more probable place. So what we learn right here is that we do formal charges, valence electrons minus a sign, signed or half its bonding, and all of its lone pairs. You can see what a sign really means when you do that. Okay? Find your numbers. Pick the structures that have the greatest number of zeros possible. Look at the ones that approach zeros possible. is most probable because you don't have electrons being manipulated and jumped around. And then, if you have to have a negative, that negative must be on the most electronegative atom, which means that's more probable. So this one is the best structure. And that's a skill that's going to serve you well. Your next test, you'll have structures to draw, and I'll say what is the most, but most probable structure, and you'll use formal charges. But formal charges help us identify some other things. They help us with identifying something called resonance and explaining that a little bit in bond order, and help us with more advanced structures. Okay, and I'll get to that today. So let's try another one. Let's get rid of this. 
Okay. And let's go to another one. Let's do nitrous oxide. Now, nitrous oxide is laughing gas. Okay, it's found in your dentist. And it's also a gas they use as the propellant for whipped cream. Okay? So we can laugh at it. Well, you don't want to do that. Why not? But see, that's not a good enough reason why not for high school kids to grab tea. <laughs> we should not. Okay. Unfortunately, I do Only think there's a cream in my fridge. Now, so let's do N2O. Now, if you have N2O, we have two N's and an O. So. No. Christmas in July. Child the door. Yeah, that just kept going, right? Imagine if it just hit someone in the head. Did it go into the staircase? It's like one. Okay. Why is it? It's N2O. Two N's. Why All right. Why wouldn't the O be in the middle? Well, we know it's not. <laughs> when? I want to be in the middle. It's symmetrical. Okay. It's symmetrical. So, in any case, let's put the end in. All right. I guess the better reason is that nitrogen, okay, um, it has more possibilities with the with with. You think about it. Nitrogen wants to share three more. So therefore, it has more possibilities to bond in both directions. Oxygen wants to share two more. It's kind of like, you know, where would I put an H? H has is a terminal atom with one bond. Oxygen likes to make two. So it's more realistic to think that oxygen will be at the end. Nitrogen likes to make three bonds, correct? Why? Because it's three away, so it's going to be a more central atom. Look at carbon. Why is carbon a central atom? It has four bonds. So the idea is that because nitrogen has three possible bonding scenarios, it's better central atom, okay? Uh, any case, given this, let's do, let's do, uh, well, what the possibilities? Let's do it. So let's go with chill bond first. One, two, three, four, five. This oxygen will do purple in the middle or blue. I don't know what it is. Purple. And I'm putting out the valence electrons, and oxygen has, of course, six. I know some people don't like this scenario right here. They'll say, oh, oxygen didn't bring one. Doesn't matter. At this point in time, don't live the, live the idea that oxygen has to bring one electron, so does N. Hey, they'll throw the electrons out. Remember, these are just dots. Electrons are really waves, okay? So that's, you notice everybody fulfills the octet rule here, correct? We're dealing with row two elements. They all must fulfill that. That's a possibility. Okay, well, let's try a double bond through this. Bring this down to a double bond. Then I have one, two, three, four, five left. How is oxygen ox like filling the octet rule? If it By sharing, it feels like it has eight. But it's only making one bond with the two electrons? Right? Yes. Yes. Feels like it has eight right there. Then Shouldn't how does the nitrogen two? in the middle feel eight? No, they could okay. be two. Like this. Why, that's why, why is it messing with me? Like, I don't know why they can bother me. Okay. 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 I don't know. It's all right. The, the middle nitrogen has five, two. Double bond here, one, two, three, four. Make a double bond, and I'll just put, have one right here. And then oxygen. Christmas and July. All right, so we got oxygen here with a double bond. Why not? Now, oxygen has its eight. Notice something. The way that I have nitrogen, how many do I have? Nine, right. Can't break the octet rule. Nitrogen is a row two element. It has S and P. We're going to find tomorrow there are elements that can have expanded octets, but this must live because nitrogen has, is in the second energy level where only have S and P. So I want to move this one where? Yeah, because this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So all I got to do to make this work is move this one over. Okay, you may say, oh, uh, uh. And you can see already that I'm moving things around. 
Why didn't you just make it triple bonded? Because if I triple bonded, then I'm going to have the wrong number, right? If I triple bond, think about that. If I put another one here and here, this nitrogen will have sharing how many? Two, four, six, eight, ten. The middle one can't share ten. We're locked by that. And then, of course, the other one, let's go triple with the oxygen. Why not? Because we're tall here. So we got one bond here. One, two, three, four, five. This one goes one, two, three, four, five. And then the oxygen. One, two, three, four, five, and six. We have some issues. The middle nitrogen cannot have nine. Right now it does. Okay. This, uh, this nitrogen has what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? That's six. So this one's going to need what? Need that one to make it seven. What else is it going to need to make it work? Yeah, I got to take this one and move it over, right? Because right now oxygen has two, four, six, eight, nine. So I'm going to take this one over and move this here. And now it'll work. Everyone's got eight. No, you throw electrons out, move them around to make it work. Okay, and that's what we just did here. We just, we, we, you know, nobody owns their own electrons. We just made it work. We're putting dots in a piece of paper, trying to figure this out. But as you can feel, which one was there more movement? Which one was exchanging electrons? That's probably not going to happen between not the, the one to the right. Okay, because that one had probably the highest formal charges. But let's go put the formal charges in. Okay, so here we go. This one, five valence electrons minus, well, all lone pairs plus half. Hey, that, that one comes out great. Five minus five, zero. That's a good one. Nitrogen loves to triple bond. There you go. How about this one? Half of it's bonding, right? It's bonding, so. Sorry for the. Uh, <laughs> so, what we got here? Five minus what? Five minus four plus one. Okay, and then this oxygen, again. Okay, six minus seven, right, which is negative one. Notice the whole thing equals zero. It's not a polyatomic ion, it has to come out zero. Next one. All, five minus, it's assigned in this drawing. Well, five is five minus six, right? So this is negative one. This one, all its lone pair and half its bonding, well, it doesn't have any lone pairs. Five minus four. Valence electrons minus what's assigned. Assigned means what we put to make this work, including the, the lone pairs, half its bonding. Five minus four, of course, is plus one. Okay, and oxygen's loving life here. That's why it loves a double bond. Six minus six, six valence. It's assigned six. Half of its bonding, all its lone pairs. There's a zero. You're seeing a pattern here. Oxygen loves the double bond. Nitrogen loves the chill bond. Okay. Over here, nitrogen, half of its bonding, all of its lone pairs. That's seven. So five minus seven. There's a bad formal charge right there. Bad. Okay. Negative two. Okay, nitrogen in the middle here. Half of its bonding. It doesn't have any lone pairs. So now it's five valence minus four. Negative one. And this oxygen's left assigned with six minus uh, five, positive one. The middle one's positive one as well. Uh, five minus four is plus one. I'll make the, the charge bigger. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So everyone's zero. Okay. So you can use formal charge to, to evaluate if you did your Lewis dot diagram correct. Because if you get an overall negative number, okay, something's not right. All right, so in any case, we use this primarily to discern which one is a better structure. So which one can I get rid of? Who's got too much of a high formal charge, at least one element? Yeah, the one to the right. As you guys can see, two of these electrons had to come from the other elements to make it work. The chances of that happening are nil. Electrons aren't transferred among um, covalently bonded compounds because they hold on to them tightly. So now we're left with these two. 
with everything I taught you, who would be the most um, the most probable structure? The first one, right? Because the first one, I have to have a negative one. And so oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. It's off to the right. And that would be the correct answer based on everything I taught you. And that's how you would do it. Now, you're going to see, party people, that this theory okay, will run its course. We're going to find a point, and it's going to come pretty fast, where this balanced bond theory stuff, hybridization, dots to a piece of paper, even formal charges, which are helping us now figure out what's the best structure when it's, you're going to see that tonight. But they co it, it comes to an end because eventually we know that electrons aren't dots. There aren't point charges. They're waves. So there's going to be some limitations. And, and here's an example of one of them. Given an AP test, given a test for me, and I said to you, what's the best structure? You're armed with formal charge. You don't know real life data. So the answer would be here. In real life, okay, the best structure is both of these. Both of these. Somehow, Somehow, both of these structures exist at the same time. Now, this isn't superpositioning. This isn't quantum mechanics craziness. Okay, what it means is somehow N2O, nitrous oxide, exists as both of them. And let me explain. Given some data here, and this is known experimental evidence. Okay, and now bond length. And we're going to use bond energy and bond length at some point coming up soon. Now, we're going to start with bond length. If you've got two nuclei, that are simultaneously attracting an electron. If the bond is stronger, the nuclei guy get pulled in. So if you've got overlapping sigma bonds, and then you have what? A double and triple, the bond length gets shorter and shorter. So as you add more electrons and other bonds, these guys attract them more and they get pulled in. So the bond length, the length of the bond between the nuclei is the direct proportion Okay, or inversely related to the strength, right? So the shorter the bond length, the stronger the bond. That makes sense? And we know something. A triple bond is stronger than a double or a single because you're adding an extra bond. We know the pi bond is a weaker bond, but still another level of stability added. So what do they know? When you look at a single end-to-end -end bond, okay, a single end-to-end -end bond, they find that experimentally that the bond length is 0.146 nanometers. A double bonded end to end is 0.125. So this right here, if it existed this way, we would measure this as 0.125 nanometers. That's the length that exists between these two nuclei and that bond. If there's a triple bonded end in a molecule, That'd be 0 0.110. So this would be 0 0.110 nanometers. And so what we find, if this was the preferred choice, based on formal charges, charges loaded with that, you'd be right. And so if it, this was the preferred structure, this would be the value we get for the bond length. What we actually get is something in between, 0.113. And so somehow, these two structures are a combination of each other. They don't go back and forth, they blend together. And that's what we call resonance. Resonance is when you have two structures where essentially there's a blending of two or more structures. And that blending, okay, is identified by these types of data. And what blending does, and this is important, the blending creates a scenario, this is important, delocalized electrons. Delocalized, meaning somehow electrons are able to move back and forth. If there's a double, if there's a bond here, and there's a double bond here, somehow that electron is able to move throughout this molecule. And that's what resonance represents, that there is some delocalization, which is unlike many covalent compounds. Covalent compounds hold on to electrons tightly. They do so so much that they're brittle compounds. Think of an OCD person holding on to something. That's mine. That's mine. And someone fights for it, you're going to break it right here. Okay? But resonance means that 
Electrons aren't held that tightly. They're able to move throughout the elements to give them stability. That means all of these nuclei are simultaneously attracting that possible wave. Okay, and what does it do for the chemical? Well, it stabilizes it. It allows it to exist. Some structures say, well, how can that exist because of that? And something else, N2O, as we talked about, is the propellant, okay, in, um, in um, whipped cream. So going through all of this, you could go through this like as I did. Let's get there. Okay, maybe. And so there is the resonant structure. So when you do have resonance, and I'll, I'll show you how you identify that in, in the next example, you draw both structures with a double arrow. It doesn't mean that this is the right structure and this. It means that these are blended together somehow, that the electrons are delocalized. And think about this. Look at this one. Is this a polar or nonpolar molecule just by based on everything polar. you've learned? Yeah. Polar. How about this one? Polar. polar. You expect that this would not dissolve in fats. Okay, whipped cream is fats, okay, which are nonpolar. Yeah. Fats are hydrocarbons. So this should not mix with fat. So why do they use it as a propellant? Because this electron is, or electrons can blend back and forth, they wind up making the entire molecule very, very nonpolar. And therefore, N2O is nonpolar because of that. Remember, what's polarity? An unequal distribution of what? Electrons. Well, if electrons are able to move back and forth, you're making electron density almost the same back and forth, and this molecule is very, very nonpolar. Nonpolar enough to interact with the nonpolar cream and dissolve in it, which makes sense. When you release the pressure, the gas will take what? The whipped cream with it. If it, this was a polar molecule, the gas would probably come out first, and then you'd have to you know, push out the cream. So there are implications to this. Now, you would never, ever have to figure this out based on data, but I could, you know, again, if it was just formal charges, everything I taught you, you'd say that's the structure, and that's how it'd be. Okay, let's move on. Okay? Let's move on to this one. All right, and I know I'm running out of time here, but this is important. Let's go to, let's go to nitrate ions. I want to draw this together. Maybe, because I'm missing something. All right, well, let's do it on the board, because I don't know this. All right, so let's do it on the board. Okay, so nitrate ion. Probably sitting somewhere in front of me. So nitrate ion. Now this is on table F. So watch with me. I'm going to take an N. Let's take an N. I'm taking an L right now. Here's an N. And I put the O's out. Now I don't know if it's this shape, but I'm just guessing. Remember, this is what? Trial and error. When you do a Lewis dot diagram. Now, put out the valence electrons. One, two, three, four, and five. Put out the valence electrons for my oxygen. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, and six. This oxygen feels like it has eight. This one has eight. I have issues with the nitrogen. Well, this oxygen has issues too, right? Seven? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to try to double bond here because that's all I really got in my toolkit. So this one would have what? Eight, eight if, if it was a double point. And this one would have eight if it took an electron from its environment. I'm going to write that as a triangle. So this one has to gain an electron from its environment, party people. Okay? And I'm going to rewrite this. N, single bonded to an O. And I'm just double bonded to the O here. Make sure you have two lone pairs. O here. Now, 
hold on to your ponies for a second. I put the double bond here. Oh, why couldn't it be here? Or here? It could. Right. In fact, what's a, what's a, what's a formal charge here for double bonded O? Um, wait, no, just zero, zero, zero. Good. Single bonded O. Good. Right, which means an N must be what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 minus 4 plus. If I put the double bond over here, does the formal charges change? No, just where they are, right? So I'm gonna, I have th two other possibilities, could, don't I? Where is, what's, what's this possibility? Where could, where could I draw another one? Could I draw another one with a dull bond over here? There's two other possibilities. This has resonance. Okay, homework's going to be the back side. I'm going to post a five to ten minute video to finish this concept.